Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you for coming back and joining us. I'm Michelle Charlton. I'm from Skills Education, and I'm absolutely delighted to be introducing the last of Deb Carr's 10-session series on doing RPL better. We were just talking about it in the green room, the fact that uh, it seems like the other day when we were just gearing up to start this series and it's been an interesting ride as we've gone throughout the ten series, the nine series so far to hear about Deb's research into uh, RPL candidates, their experiences and the outcomes of that research in the ways that RTOs can implement more effective practices for RPL. So uh, I've jumped the gun a little bit because um, that is quite exciting and we're coming to, you know, the end of, uh, exactly, Melissa, such a quick thing that's gone past. But, um, and I think we've got a lot of people who've joined us over the duration of the journey and it's good to see everyone back. If you are joining us for the first time, Thank you and welcome to, to the session. Uh, the chat window is how we're going to be engaging throughout. So typically, Deb will present some of her content and then we'll view a pre-recorded interview with the RPL expert of the week. And throughout that, we just pop in our comments and our questions and generate discussion in the chat window. Now, Deb's also taken the time to prepare a handout for today and you can download that straight onto your computer. Just flick over to the handouts tab and you can grab that. And anyone who hasn't been able to join us for the live session but is registered will be able to access everything via the recording. Uh, anyone who has registered, you just log in through the Better portal, log in that way and you can uh, watch for 30 days after the event. Now, that's everything in terms of the admin. Um, as I alluded to, the fact that these sessions are being recorded, so uh, we'll all be on our best behaviour. <laughs> but Deb is our expert around RPL. And as I said, um, these sessions have really um, delved into the outcomes of Deb's research. Now, Deb just recently completed a Master's of Education where her thesis was around um, the RPL candidate as a neglected stakeholder. So that was done through um, Charles Darwin University and part of that incorporated an international study tour through Germany and Thailand. So we're really reaping the rewards of a lot of um, study experience and international perspective in these sessions. So very, very lucky to have Deb along with us today and um, hand over to you now, Deb. Can't wait to see what the final session shares with us in terms of tips to do RPL better. Mm. Thanks for that, Michelle. Um, just notably, um, we have a debrief at the end of the session. It takes about four minutes. Um, that just gives you a summary um, of what we've learned over the 10 sessions. And I've learned as well um, in putting together and articulating the, the lessons from a, a slightly different perspective than the thesis, um, but also from our guests. Um, which I'm um, very appreciative of um, and Wendy's here today um, as one of those regular guests that we've had um, throughout the series. So we'll have a look at that if we've got a couple of minutes at the end. Um, so these sessions are for RPL program managers and practitioners that seek to do RPL better. My research revealed many problems associated with the practice of RPL and there's no surprises there. We, but we now have empirical evidence for, of some of those problems um, the, uh, from candidates' perspective and as to the extent of each problem. As I continue to research, uh, listen and practice, potential solutions are evolving and this 10-part series delivers possible solutions to doing RPL better, mainly at program level. I think these will improve RPL practices because they speak directly to candidate experience and we're all about customer experience um, these days. So we have systemic problems with RPL. Funding and overly prescriptive units are two big problems from my perspective. But these sessions recognise RPL can be done better within the system that we have. Australia's nationwide competency-based RPL framework is envied by many, many countries. The changing nature of work, globalisation, ageing demographics and the rapid pace of technological advancements drives national imperatives for RPL. COVID-19 has placed even more imperative on RPL as people transition careers and jobs. RPL can make skills more visual to the individuals themselves and employers and in this way RPL can improve under 
employment the, and, uh, and the efficient use of skills. The efficient use of skills directly impacts our economy and social fabric. So today you will hear um, findings from my research that are relevant to this topic. And also I'll share an interview with Wendy Cato who has decades of experience with RPL and she's in our audience today and we'll chat throughout. I've tried to structure this, uh, these webinars to provide you with A, evidence-based information on candidates' experience of RPL, and then B, real-life examples of good practice that offer solutions to improve those negative experiences. Your contribution increases the value of this session for all of us. So please make comments throughout so we can expand on your interest at the end. Your handout includes a summary of all guests and their tips and tricks. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve here today? RPL candidates find it difficult to elicit workplace support in gathering evidence to support their application. My research found eliciting employer buy-in was the third biggest difficulty for RPL candidates in navigating their RPL application. One research subject phoned ASQA. But just out of curiosity, I rang ASQA and I said, I just want to double check that in fact there's no compulsion for employers to provide anything, which there isn't. She felt disempowered with no agency to elicit employer buy-in at all. Additionally, increased prevalence of contract work and frequency of changing jobs exacerbates this, this dynamic by decreasing the agency of RPL candidates. We will see today that flexible assessment helps reduce this problem However, building employer partnerships makes this possible. So there was two parts to my research, interviewing assessors and interviewing candidates. I interviewed 21 assessors with collective experience of over 5,000 RPL assessments across all, all AQF levels, all institution types and many different training packages. 51% of assessors said explicitly eliciting employer buy-in for evidence caused difficulties for candidates. This was usually in the context of past employers. However, two assessors referred to those types of difficulties being experienced with current employers. Candidates typically say they left employers on bad terms or not terribly good terms or haven't continued any kind of relationship after leaving. Two assessors said getting any managerial support was difficult. I left my employer on bad terms, not in a good place with current or previous employer. I haven't spoken to them in years. That company has closed down. My manager is never around to sign it. Assessors said lack of confidence in approaching employers was a barrier. Candidates themselves have very little understanding of what they are getting employers to vouch for. Candidates lack of confidence to approach employers and ask them to vouch for them. They lack the confidence, sorry. One assessor stated this difficulty is regularly a trigger for candidates to self-select out of RPL. So I followed the journey of 11 candidates over five months. It is a bigger problem than identified by assessors. It has more impact and it occurs more frequently. 73% of candidates said employer buy-in for evidence caused difficulties. This difficulty is complex and substantial. Candidates are seeking employers to vouch for their claim of what they have done in the workplace that maps to components of the unit. Difficulties involve many facets from logistics to mindset, and it is the most frequently expressed difficulty. Because it was such a big problem, I sorted candidates' exp expressions into four main themes. Firstly, mindset to approach employers, particularly past employers. But I think my concern is now to the time that has elapsed since I did work 
did the work. So I feel like the established relationship might have also elapsed. So it's just actually more of a relationship concern that I'm going to be just ringing this person out of the blue and say, I know we haven't talked for ages, but I really want you to do this thing for me. I just felt bad. I had to ask her to do more. She's not invested in this in any way at all. The other lady I worked with has faced some personal challenges, so I don't want to hassle her. And thinking strategically, who to ask? Because there's, been, there's some people I don't really want to talk to. The other four main challenge, the three main challenges, structural changes in the organisation, preparing employers and eliciting their buy-in. Structural changes in businesses make it difficult to source a third party report. They've left or gone on long service leave. I've got no one in authority that can say, yes, you did this and this is the feedback. I'm quite upset about that. Preparing employers for integral third party verification is difficult. Candidates want it easy to be, want it to be easy for employers to do. Trying to explain it so that employers understand is difficult. I want to present it to them in the easiest way possible because they're all really busy. I would also suggest that some assessors themselves find it difficult to explain the RPL construct to employers. It is difficult to elicit buy-in particularly without a systemic compulsion for employers to provide anything at all. I just had a satellite role in that team to support them in their learning and development. I was a contract trainer. I've got to do all the dog work and I've got to sell it to them and ask a favour from them. That's all goodwill. I was stuck on that mindset like how can I get someone to do or say or provide that evidence for me? People can be professional, but outside that, you often find that once you leave an organisation, they don't really care. Many assessors also said employer behaviour adds to candidates' difficulties. This is behaviour that is not conducive to continue engagement in the RPL process for the candidate. This dynamic is not evident in any research to date that I've found. There is research that finds employers are not supportive, but this behaviour is more overt than the absence of support. Employers are saying that it's okay the candidate doesn't need to have this evidence. Sometimes employers want to speed up the process because they need them to be qualified. Typical sentiments from employers were to give them, just give them the RPL. He's been doing it for, uh, for 30 years. Employers have a vested interest in the RPL outcome and try to influence the process. This seemed to be prevalent even in our own training sector, particularly around the TAE upgrade. A story from an assessor who had recently been an RPL candidate. My employer, an RTO, had vested interest in the success of the RPL and that impacted on the integrity of the process. They were encouraging me to say, I've designed and developed this piece of evidence, which I knew I hadn't. This was very conflicting. Also a story from an assessor working in the mining industry. The employer prefers to put the candidate through RPL rather than the full course and sometimes they are not suitable. Candidates and employers have inaccurate expectations. I've had heated arguments and angry candidates and angry employers. Candidates have been selected by employers as part of a recruitment process to enrol in the fast tracked option and who are quite likely to be assessed as not yet competent. This is a high risk assessment using a national assessment instrument put out by WorkSafe Australia and includes mass questions. This particular assessor has given evidence five times in a coroner court investigating workplace deaths. 
is very invested in a robust RPL assessment. Sometimes there is stigma colleagues attach to RPL pathways. Three assessors said that employers and candidates' colleagues openly state candidates are not supported as in their opinion RPL is not a good option. Some think it's cheating or not thorough. Employers use the offer of funding to influence RPL choices. Employers only fund for coursework pathways, as we um, heard before. Sorry, it's, um, coursework path pathways. Th this is um, typically when a large employer has a service level agreement with a particular RTO and they will only fund the RPL if they go through that particular RTO. Or if a particular... Um, or for RPL only. This impacts candidates by making it difficult to progress the RPL, takes away choice and feeds already inaccurate expectations. Sometimes it appears from candidates' perspectives that there is an underlying assumption that what the employer vouches is correct and what the candidate claims is only correct if the employer verifies it. But what if they don't or what if they won't? Personal relationships also plays into this dynamic. And lastly, assessors mentioned armed forces, childcare institutions, finance sector, aged care homes, large corporations and the police force as examples of workplaces that have sensitive information not easily shared for RPL purpose. This often means that records need to be heavily redacted, which can impede the utility as assessment evidence. Candidates face difficulty with privacy and confidentiality confidentiality issues when seeking to produce documentary evidence. For TAE students, the subject of my research, the issues were mainly proprietary and privacy legislation. The difficulty is exacerbated for contract trainers and consultants. This is not an insurmountable problem. However, this research has provided evidence of associating difficulties that should not be ignored, such as time taken to address privacy issues, such as for Alan, who used to work at a bank. So I think the challenge here is that they're asking for evidence of competence around customer interactions that I can't show directly due to their policies. So I can only kind of give excerpts and talk about what was accomplished rather than showing the work directly, which is obviously a challenge for this RTO. So I began the process to try and get access. My line manager and my general manager even spoke directly to the executive general manager about me sharing some of the work. I was able to go through this process fairly seamlessly, but still a long process. It probably took a good 12 weeks internally. So Wendy shares, these problems stem from two prevalent practices, assessments, assessors not leading RPL process and being part of evidence collection and lack of real engaging relationships with employers and industries. She has some solutions to share. Please feel free as we listen um, to comment and this will inform our discussion afterwards. Joining us yet again, Wendy. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be back. Yay. And for our last session too, number 10. And the most exciting one, because I think it actually encompasses all of your research together. So I'm really uh, quite thrilled to be here. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'll do a recap on our, um, on our webinars because I do uh, agree with you. It brings all the other tips together, I think. Mm. Mm, absolutely. So what's your experience with this problem, Wendy? 
Oh, well, you know, I've been around for a long time, so I've seen a lot of things. And I, I, I you know, um, I was really interested when I read your research because I, it actually just hit me as soon as I read some of the statements that were inside your research from the candidates and the assessors that um, two things that actually, you know, sort of hit me in the face. One, the first one was that the assessor was not leading the RPL uh, process and being part of the evidence collecting. Mm. They'd abdicated that back to the candidate, which is what was reflected in some of your candidates' comments, not necessarily pointedly at the assessor, but just saying that they felt frustrated and they didn't know and they didn't feel supported in going out and getting evidence and those well, sorts yeah, of things. Yeah, they certainly felt like it was left up to them and they and then yeah. that made them feel frustrated because they had no agency to elicit any point. Exactly. And again, that's you know one of the things that we've talked about right throughout your series is the assessor abdicating their role and leading it totally to the candidate to deal with whatever whether it be with employers or somebody else and so they've just been stuck and and you know those people don't necessarily have those skills either mm -hmm. i mean if you're you know coming in from a lower level or you're not in a people person type um uh, occupation mm -hmm. so, so those skills are quite hard for some of those people and to just say oh look go out and get this off your employer that could be quite difficult and confronting mm -hmm. for them mm -hmm. if they're not supported in that process mm -hmm. and i think the the second thing that really struck me was the lack of engagement uh, by RTOs in their processes. You know, just throwing out a form willy-nilly mm. uh, and, and actually trying to get the employer to do your work for you and not even having any contact with that employer or actually guiding them as to what you actually want, just giving them what you think you need as an assessor or as an RTO. Mm -hmm. So I think your research, you know, kind of honed in on on my beliefs about you know some of the poor practices that are actually going in RPL still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it was widespread and it caused um, significant um, barriers for yeah. candidates. Mm. Yeah, and you know clearly um, these RTOs are not getting employer buy-in, and that's their fault. That's not the candidates. That's their fault. So for the assessors that are saying you know it's a problem and it's a candidate problem, no, it's an RTO problem. It's absolutely and totally an RTI problem. So you um, you gave some examples around what you've seen um, that contravenes um, what you believe is a good TPR. Can you tell us a story about that? Well, you know, um, third party reports are actually quite controversial. Mm -hmm. uh, in my day, <laughs> back in the old days, third party reports were considered as indirect evidence and now considered as supplementary. Um, people sort of in some cases, you still need them as indirect evidence because you're not necessarily going to be there. But it's the construction of the third party report that is the most um, worrying trend, I guess you'd say. And people say, oh, I think I was in one of your other seminars and somebody said, oh, your third party reports are just useless because they're always non-compliant. They're only non-compliant if you design them to be non-compliant. They're totally compliant. Trust me, I've been in the business for you know 14 plus years. I have never had a third party report not back. And that's because I'm asking the third party direct questions in English. They're the yes, no type questions. I'm not asking them anything personal. I'm not asking them to divulge anything. I you know, saw a third party report recently that asked them to comment or, or make notes on somebody's uh, various tasks that they'd undertaken while they were in the workplace. That's not for the, the third party to do. What kind Either, of comments? Oh, things like, you know, um, has X, Y and Z undertake, you know, this certain task? And if so, how did they do it? And what, what happened and what were the in instances around it? That's not for the third party to comment on. Mm -hmm. That is actually for the, if they want that, for the person or the applicant to comment on and have signed off by a third party. If I got a report and let's just say I had four or five people in one business having to go through a, an RPL for whatever reason, say a licence upgrade or qualification upgrade in a, in a licensed area where they had to have it, I'm not going to write you 10 pages. What do you think this is? You're not paying me. You do it yourself. Better than that, get off your back and get out and get into my place and do an observation. Then you'll find out what that is. Also included in this report was a thing about what was the person's strengths and weaknesses. You can oh, me. really? Kidding me, really? Wow. That is not a third party's place to say that. And most businesses won't let you do that. Well, that's you like know. a performance review. Well, it is. And it, it's not a role of a third party. What you want to know from a third party is does the person do this? Yes or no? It's as simple as that. Don't need a comment. Don't want you to say anything because I'm going to take your yes and no stuff 
and I'm going to put it with the other evidence and weigh it with the other evidence that I've needed to collect it, such as the practical, such as some conversations about knowledge questions, whatever. And it's supplementary evidence, unless I'm looking to do something about consistency, and then I might actually marry it up to a, um, an employment record that says that this person has worked in this job for a period of time. So you don't need to ask all this stuff. That's just an accessibility lazy. Really, really lazy. Mm -hmm. How do you think RTOs can navigate confidentiality and privacy? Well, <clears throat> it's about them being, um, what's the word? Um, understanding mm -hmm. that these things happen. You know, organisations just aren't going to hand out their documents to you just because you need them for an assessment. And again, that's what I'm saying is assessors need to get out of the building. This is this tied to this inflexibility, which, you know, you have one in your series of, about people not having flexible assessment tools. Many assessors think that it has to be paperwork and it has to be the applicant giving them the paperwork and they're not even leaving the building. That's the assessor. Mm -hmm. The assessor needs to get out and start to think about how some of this can work. Obviously, if I'm working in counselling, no, you're not gonna come in and sit in on a practical. No, you are not getting my client's records. You know, what I want you to know, and this is where your third party comes in, is do I do counselling? Do I meet with people? Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Mm -hmm. If you wanna know how well I do it, then you hold a challenge test. You don't ask for all this other stuff. Can I so ask a it's early a question around this yes no question. Sometimes I, I think RTOs do um, want more information because they want some context to or maybe be assured that the supervisor is not just ticking and flicking. And I yep. think that was mentioned by one of my candidates that she yep. was, you know, ultimately in the end, it, it didn't hold a lot of integrity because, you know, the supervisor was so busy and yeah, whatever, where do I need to sign? Yeah, and that again is about the relationships that you form with the with the clients that you service. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of people, a lot of RTOs, the people that they service are the ones that their business development managers pick up and ring around. You know, you have these people making in, in call centres, making all these calls, and there is no interaction with the business at all. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you work and you have a true business development manager, they know who these people are. And when they sign somebody up, you would be the first person out there saying, here we are, here's my car, congratulations, this is what we do, ring me if you need assistance, do any of this, you know, and start to form that relationship with that industry. And then you don't come into those kind of problems, you know, mm -hmm. because they know you, they know that you're not a tick and flick person. They yeah. know that you're actually going to give. So if you're creating a relationship rather than, I'm going to take money from you, I'm going to take money from you, I'm going to take money from you, of course they think you're dodgy. Well, with yeah. an RPL, there's no money transactions, really. Well, it goes, somebody gets paid. It's not done for free. Mm. So, you know, and in some cases, as I've said previously, I've worked in fee-for-service markets and the employers have paid. And I only want to pay for a good service. Mm. You know, they only want to pay, you know, and I've worked on big government contracts in RPL and I can tell you, the government the only wants to pay for a good service. So I don't want a chicken flick because it comes back to them. So, you know, your reputation is the way, as an RTO, is the way you behave and the way you treat your clients. Absolutely, and that, and that um, relationship that you have with employers. Yeah. Yeah. So I want yeah. to just go back to that, um, how um, having a good relationship with the employers gives you as the assessor assurance that um, a yes, no um, TPR, when it's ticked yes, means yes, you know, and I can yeah. be assured that that's a yes. Um, I guess on the same token, a good relationship with the employers allows me to um, allows supervisors to tick the no box as well. Like yes. what happens when there's a no ticked, you know? So having a good relationship with employers would absolutely be critical in that circumstance. And then you can actually bring the employer up because this is the other thing. People take it on face value. They actually don't validate the third party report. Now, if you're not validating third party report with the supervisor, how do you know the applicant didn't tick it? You don't. So when, you, when I validate a third party report, I ring up the, the employer and I already, in most cases, have a good relationship with them. And I say, I've got this third party report for John and you've ticked everything. Is that correct? And I go, no, I actually ticked that he couldn't do X, Y, and Z tasks. <laughs> and I go, okay. So obviously Johnny's you know, I've got a bit of white out or done something to arrange it. So I just say to the employer, or if, if he said, I said to him, I've noticed you've ticked you know, box X with an O, can you explain to me? And he said, but we don't actually perform that task. 
in our organisation. That's not to say that Johnny can't do it, but within our organisation, that's not something that we would expect them to do and it would not likely happen. So there you've got your answer as to why it was ticked no. And that's the important part of the validation. And again, that relies on that relationship that you have with that person. So I would simply say to Johnny, look, Johnny, you don't do that in your workplace. Let's talk about how we can cover that, you know? And Johnny says to me, oh, I work as a volunteer in XYZ company and I do that then I go, great. Here's the second third party report. Go out and get them to sign that. They don't have to tick. And I actually put on my third party reports. You are not required to tick every box. Mm. If there is something that the, that the applicant doesn't do, please put NA, not okay. applicable, in mm. the comments. So I know. And then I can say to the applicant, you know, you're not doing this in this job, so you might need two or three third party reports, not just one. Well, that's increasingly the case as people are uh, yeah. working at, uh, for a number of different employers. Exactly. So, you know, but, uh, you know, uh, for some reason, assessors and RTOs just think, you know, one size fits all, so one third party will do it. It mm. won't in some cases. You know, there are plenty of casual workers, whether they be in the trades or in the hospitality or, you know, um, even in, in training and assessment. There are plenty of people that work across a number of employers and they might do some, some things for some employers and not for others. Mm. So you might need a multiple of third parties. Mm. And that was um, actually mentioned by some candidates that they were um, contracted um, to work for a, a number of different organisations and they were just uh, regarded as, you know, casual or contractors yeah. and were never able to be given access to workplace documents to, like, yeah. artefacts to um, provide as evidence because they were just, you know, casuals or um, contractors. Yeah, yeah. And this is where your conversation comes in and the final interview. So you get what you can and then you have this final interview process that will either validate or, or verify or fill in gaps. And it might be that the person can't get the documents, but they can say to you, look, you know, uh, when I was in an accident, this is what I did, da, 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 da. I had to go and fill in this, I had to fill in that, I had to do this, I had to do that. And so they can give you that knowledge and, oh, yes, of course, this needs to document it. <sighs> might have to do some writing, mightn't they? <laughs> or they could be like you and record it and put it on a video and then they've got it. You know, like there are alternatives here. It's not all about, you know, you know, well, with me, I've got to do all this work as an assessor. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned ways an RTO um, can build relationships with employers. Um, what are some questions an RTO can ask themselves to um, help establish those good relationships? Uh, I think there's, there's a multitude of questions, but probably the ones I'd, that come off the top of my head are things like, when was the last time you contacted a, a, an employer and didn't want anything? Because most of the time when you're contacting you either want them to come and do a validation or you want to fog them off one of your courses or you want something from them. You don't contact them to say, hi, how are you? How's business going? Mm -hmm. You know, during COVID, I've seen you shut, you know, um, you know. How are you going? Are you going to survive? You know, here's a bunch of flowers. Here's some cookies. Here's something just to make you feel a little bit better. When was the last time you sent an email or a card or well, um, I have a daughter and she works in HR and she used to take around a little cake of donuts or trays of cakes um, to people um, just to say thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being in our network or, or we're sorry you're having a hard time um, mm -hmm. or, or happy, happy birthday because it's your 10th anniversary of your work bias. And, and most people forget that, you know, you forget as an individual you like that. Why wouldn't you do that for a business? Uh, the other thing I ask is, when was the last time you went out and conducted an assessment in the workplace? Haven't done that? Mm. Why? Mm. You know, when was the last time you changed your RPL process to fit the candidate in the workplace? Or, you know, we've got this, you know, it's all pretty well set in concrete, you know, we've had it buried, you know, 10 foot down, you know, for the last 30,000 years. So why would we dig it up now and look at it, you know? Work fine for us in the past. Well, that's so, yeah. what my research is about, that, you know, it is actually broken. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes it's broken and you need to dig it up and review it, you know. And, you know, what your research is showing is that a lot of RPL processes are actually broken mm. and people aren't, aren't getting the message mm. that, you know, you just can't do, um, you know, what you did 10 years ago today and you need to be more flexible and more proactive about the way you treat your candidates and, your, and their employers. Because if you treat them well, the employers, they will give you more business. Strange about that. 
Yeah, well, that's what um, the ladies from WA were saying. You know, they yeah. don't um, actually have a marketing campaign for RPL anymore. No. Um, employers right. approach them. Yeah, and they don't have a marketing campaign for candidates. Candidates approach mm -hmm. them because it's word of mouth. There's an old story in marketing that if you do something really well, it might go to about 10 people. But if you cheese somebody off, it'll go to about 50. So think about your odds. And I'd be trying to do stuff well rather than cheese people off. Um, and that was evidence with my candidates as well. They did, um, they explained how they looked for an, uh, um, an RTO. And one of the things that they looked on was the so social media, talking to relatives. Mm. So they, they are becoming smart shoppers. Um, yeah, absolutely. Mm. You know, we all know which, you know, in some cases, we all know which RTOs to go to and not to go to. Mm. And don't think that the public doesn't know that. No, because you they know they've got uncles and aunts and families and colleagues and you know they they people know how to source information that they need yeah. Yeah. Um, you also said that um, ask employers what they are prepared to give what does what do you mean by that oh by asking them you know like nobody goes out and says to them you know what can you do when they design their forms they don't go out and ask an employer and say what do you think mm. is this a good form or isn't it mm. or, or how much do you think that employers in your field? Because I noticed that Nicole from Western Australia was saying that they get really good detailed reports of their employers, but they have a relationship with them mm -hmm. and they've built that over the years. And so the employers have learned that, that um, Nicole and, and oh, sorry, I forgot Lorraine. the other lady's name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, do a good job. They're not tick and flick merchants and that they're, they're wanting the same thing that the employer wants is, you know, good, competent, employees and so they've learned from that whereas when when you're not consulting and i would absolutely guarantee you that nicole would be taking their stuff out to them and saying you know or somebody would be saying to them you know that last third party report you sent out to us that you just did you know it was a bit on the ordinary side we prefer to see something else added into it whereas what happens is that a lot of uh third party reports are, are developed in-house and are pretty ordinary at the best of that and then you go and place out a pretty ordinary report or, or some sort of feedback from the employer and the employer goes yeah no i wouldn't be dealing with them so if you're not talking to your industry and you don't understand your industry that you're you're you know going to be working in that space in then how do you expect them to engage with you, mm, you know, i can't understand the form you sent them mm -hmm. um i have heard um a number of occasions where a good relationship between an rto and an enterprise um, has resulted through RPO processes in improved workplace processes. Have you yes. ever heard of that? Yes, because traditionally, in the old days, as I talk about, a lot of assessors were actually embedded into industry. Well, where I came from in South Australia, a lot of assessors were actually um, embedded into industry or did most of their assessments on the job. So I'm used to that kind of thing. So, you know, you go out and I know people, you know, like I, I used to work with an organisation called Swires and I had a good relationship with them. Um, they would send people to us to come and do, you know, say like forklift training or whatever else. I would then ring up the manager and say, or the HR manager and say, what's the feedback? And he goes, most of them liked it, but then we had this one guy, da, da, da. And I'm going, okay, I'll take that, you know. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll Go and change some stuff, you know, we'll work our way through it. So if you're not talking to your employers, how, how do you, I just don't understand how people think that they're getting those kind of relationships and making sure that the stuff that they're giving employers is actually what employers feel comfortable and confident in being able to, to make. Mm, yeah, exactly as you say, are prepared to give. So last, would you like to share some of Wendy's tips? I only have one tip. Okay. And it's the big tip and it's probably, um, it wraps up everything, like the whole of your series. And I just like to remind people that industry is not there to do the assessor's job or the RTO's job. Mm. You need to create good relationships and ask industry what they're prepared to give to you and to work with them. Mm. Anything else is simply the RTO and the assessor abdicating their roles. Mm. And in other words, in layman's terms, they're getting over. So do your jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else more to add? No, I think I've said enough, but I do want to say to people, thank you so much for your 10 
series. I think they've been excellent and you've had um, some great insights into what's actually happening in the RPO world and hopefully for other RTOs and assessors, they've learned something from your series and are beginning to understand more that this is just not a desk jockey job and it's not a, a tick and a flick job. It's a case of becoming involved in your actual assessment. So mm. hopefully we'll see some good benefits come out of that for future RPO applicants. <laughs> Thanks for your time today, Wendy. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Yeah, bye. Thanks, Wendy. We've had some um, interesting comments, so they don't come through on the recording, so I'll just brief um, about those. Um, so Therese is saying that she's finding it difficult um, to source guidelines of good practice for collecting assessment uh, and also assessing RPL. Wendy, um, I put in a one of the handouts a while ago. She's got a great ebook that talks about principles and guidelines to cover for uh, to follow for RPL. So we can make that available again. Um, also, the assessor's skill set has um, the diploma unit around um, recognition as part of that. Um, I'm looking currently around for an RTO that has that um, RPL uh, unit of competency on their scope as a standalone. Um, Carmel's um, from Queensland saying that their RPL contract, funding contract, um, says a two-step process is required to um, get the TPR first, have a, um, a professional conversation and have that verified with contact again with the employer. But then Carmel's saying that she is, there is some difficulties when you actually cannot get a response back from the employers. So you can imagine the, the, the difficulty when the candidates are trying to do that. Um, and they're not returning their emails or uh, just completely ignore, ignoring them. So I wonder if there's opportunity within that funding contract to do challenge tests at, uh, without um, the evidence from employers. And I don't have Wendy here to answer that or Carmel. Um, so why? Did um, uh, Wendy did put a comment in the Q&A there, Deb. She did say mm -hmm. in response to that that perhaps evidence could be gained in another form, perhaps the challenge test. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, again, that, that's reiterating your, your question. And Wendy, if you're a fast typer, you can <laughs> you can put the answers in. But um, mm -hmm. I found it very interesting. Wendy was so adamant about uh, do your job, and that that really is a, an interesting point when you try and put the hat on the other side of the the fence, and you think, well, from an employer's perspective, um, it isn't their job to be doing the training and assessing. It isn't their job to be providing reams and reams of paperwork. So um, particularly we were talking about it earlier, um, mm. Deb, as someone who employs others, when you, when you get these requests to fill out reams of paperwork or to make comments on things, you say, oh, when am I going to find time to do this? And you do it simply because we're in the industry and you know that that's a requirement and it's what's the status quo um, but you know for for someone who's a manager of a shop or or what have you um, they might not necessarily have any understanding of the training and assessment framework or the way the systems uh, are working or what the relevance of it is that they know about you know ordering stock um, serving customers um, managing people and you know the the, the sorts of things that you would expect from a retail assistant not to be filling out paperwork. So um, exactly, Wendy, they're not getting paid to fill in this paperwork and it really is an, a love it, a, um, a for love job in a lot of cases when you have a good relationship with someone who's asking you to do that. And that was a really um, critical part of the commentary that you were giving before that sometimes when you don't have a good relationship with the people that you need to get this evidence from, what do you do then? 
Mm, mm. Um, it was Wendy mentioned, and so did John Price actually. Yeah. Going into the workplace makes all the difference. Um, you're pretty hard to ignore when you're right in front of them. Um, mm. But also, perhaps, um, which a lot of assessors don't do. Um, I think that's probably quite closely tied to the fact that many times RPL is underfunded and the resources aren't, just, aren't there to go into the workplace. Mm. But, you know, there's a conversation around, well, actually it does, it does make it more efficient because you gather so much evidence in a workplace visit. Um, but then we talked about earlier, um, what benefit is there for employers to be involved? Yes. What can we, yeah, what, what is something, <laughs> how do they, how is there How are they benefiting that, from that? <laughs> And, and that's human nature, isn't it? Like we're all out for the what's in it for me component and what's in it for me to spend hours filling out paperwork? Um, what's in it for me to provide this for someone who's already moved on and is no longer generating income for my business? I mean, these are the sorts of questions that you could think that employers are realistically asking themselves or thinking about. So as providers of RPL, uh, what are we doing to change the systems or the processes or the practices that we're employing to, to put that WIFM component back into it? And um, Wendy's made another really good comment in the chat there, Deb, saying, like, what buy-in has there been? Did anyone establish a relationship first and go into the employer or to ring them and say, hi, this is who I am and you know, th this is part of our process. Is it okay if da 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 da? Um, there's been a fr again from the other side of the fence. There's been a few times where I've just had a, an email that says, "Oh, I'm doing a course, and you need to fill this out for me, please." Okay. <laughs> so um, there, there's a conversation going there that um, you know Wendy's asked, "Yes, do you, do you have a relationship?" Carmel's saying, "Yes, we actually do." Um, but Carmel seems to be a, a little bit suspect that the candidate may not have chosen the right person in her workplace, mm. the right person to make a comment of whether she's done the, the tasks. Um, there's that consideration, yes. There's also the consideration that there may be some personality pl plays there as well, which people are human and came out in my research that many candidates really didn't want to um, approach someone that they didn't get along with for um, yeah. effort into what they, you know, what they wanted. Yeah, and, um, and I was going to ask if your research yielded any of that, Deb, because also conversely, um, the candidate might think that the relationship is good and that they've been doing a great job, but has the question ever been asked or has the um, issue ever been explored to the point where it could be uncovered that there is a dissonance between um, the employer's perception of their performance and their own perception of performance. Maybe maybe in Carmel's case, um, this, this third party isn't the right one because, you know, the candidate might think that she's done a brilliant job and this person is the one to sign off but the supervisor or whoever this third party is is thinking yeah no they're not really that great mm, mm. added to that too one of the candidates said that their position description doesn't really describe their job I mean that kind of happens quite often so um, what they're doing in the workplace is um, different or outside or more than what their position description says. And that opens up a whole other area of investigation around um, workplace practice. And, um, you know, you might be employed to do a certain job on, and you apply according to that description, but suddenly over time tasks more for the environment changes. How often is that job description updated to reflect the current activities that are undertaken as part of that day-to-day -day job? New technology. Exactly. So there's two um, maybe um, um, things that would um, transpire as a service um, that an RTO could um um, help to elicit buy-in and that's um, identifying skills gaps sometimes that's useful for um, RTOs 
So, sorry, with organisations. So when you when you are throughout the process and you've identified skill sets, uh, skill gaps, that allows employers to target their resources to specific mm -hmm. training, which is like a skills needs analysis for um, an organisation, and that's a valuable service. And I think John touched on that in, one, in, in our webinar. Mm, absolutely. The it's other one... Sorry, Deb, I was just going yeah. to say, as long as the organisation can understand the value in that, like a lot of uh, medium to larger sized organisations, quite potentially they would know what that is, but a small business operator, have, mm. you know, what, would they recognise the language around what a skills anal skills gap analysis is and, and, again, is that actually useful to me? Mm -hmm. The second one, and that's true, um, would be more helpful for smaller businesses and that is to um, um, help identify their policies and procedures if they're within industry standards or legislative uh, requirements even. Um, I know the um, Lorraine Nicole in, in Western Australia, um, they work in the childcare industry and it had happened on a couple of occasions where their candidates couldn't get evidence of doing things in certain ways because the um, the centre didn't have a policy or procedure and actually was doing it in a way that contravened best practice. So the um, Nicole and Lorraine worked with the centre um, to build their capacity to um, improve their uh, workplace standards. Mm. Not an easy answer on any of those things. I think I think the underlying principle is though um, to build that uh, mutually respectful uh, relationship and visit them like show your face mm, yes and Wendy was saying um, just a couple of comments up there was the candidate actually counseled as to who to choose or just told that they should use their supervisor and again that's just tapping into this building relationships concept build relationships with the employer and also um, curate a bit of relationship with the candidates. So spend the time with them and, and figure out who the best person is going to be to approach these for this sort of feedback. Mm. Mm. It's tricky business, I think, particularly for, um, for funded um, RPLs because you've got to work within the um, funding contract as well as um, trying to maintain flexible. Mm. assessment Absolutely. Mm. Wendy's also just saying that one of the benefits mm. around this um, free skills gap analysis that could be offered as a trade-off it, it's a good way to give back to the employer but to say like this is um, we could use our expertise to help grow your business and um, putting our expertise across training and development to see what areas um, could be improved within your organisation. And um, Wendy's just sort of saying that could also initiate further opportunities for the RTO with that employer as well. Yeah, to train mm. those skills gaps. Mm, absolutely. That makes sense. Mm, yeah. Totally. So um, why is such a basic premise around building relationships or having respect for people um, not translating into a system that can can do that without difficulty. That that might be one of the big questions. Yeah, it is a big question. Project. <laughs> um, I yeah, um, I know that R RPL was um, when it initially started. It was more much more work based um, than it is now. Um, many RTOs um, conduct RPL at their desk. Um, rather than in the workplace, so it's kind of devolved into a <clears throat> into a desktop process, rather than a relationship with employers and building businesses, um, mm -hmm. and that's unfortunate. But we can turn it around. So RTO centricism is coming <laughs> through here <laughs> because RTO think it is all about them. Is Wendy's comment, and um, everybody thinks it's all about them. But the trick is to try and have some empathy or to, to see it from the other person's perspective and, and build that 
value in for the other person from their perspective. Mm -hmm. All right. So while we've got a couple of um, minutes before we finish and um, while I wait for any more comments that might like to come through, I'll just um, go through the... 10 webin uh, webinars that we have had and what and just the key things that we learned throughout um, number one allocate staff solely dedicated to RPL RPL candidates are often last on the to-do list for assessors many wait months for feedback we learned that allocating staff solely dedicated to RPL ensures much needed prompt prompt and continued conversations with candidates. Additionally, we started to see RPL assessment as a specialised assessment skill. RTOs that allocate staff solely dedicated to RPL grow their RPL assessors, which in turn delivers a better experience for candidates. Two, teach RPL. Understanding how to identify one's own competencies involves learning skills language. We also learned teaching employers about RPL helps. Three, social learning. Candidates often felt isolated and had no idea others were going through the same challenges. Facilitating social learning to help candidates get their head around RPL is a simple strategy to improve outcomes. Four, flexible um, advertise carefully. The majority of candidates do not understand what the RPL process entails. Many are not even aware RPL is an assessment. Building accurate expectations improves student satisfaction, builds RTO reputation and reduces lost time invested by both the RTO and the candidate. Number five, we looked at flexible assessment. We learned evidence can virtually be anything. We need to build assessor confidence and give agency to move away from the template. Six, be there. RTOs frequently do not see RPL as a supported activity. Candidates are bewildered, overwhelmed and totally confused. Candidates look for RTOs that provide support. We learnt some strategies to keep assess, um, candidates engaged. Seven, charge equal to coursework. Fee-for-service is the biggest funder for RPL. And customers base their decisions not only on price, but support. We share different business models that work. Number eight, throw out the RPL um, info book. It's intimidating and not that helpful. We looked at two very different effective approaches, a digital option and at the workplace face-to-face -face orientation option. Nine, invest in industry expertise. Lack of industry expertise narrows assessors' ability to contextualise, but also hinders a good relationship with candidates. We learnt that industry expertise is broader than currency. Industry expertise helps build a positive experience for candidates. And today, candidates do not have agency to elicit employer buy-in and navigate some challenging employer behaviour. Good relationships between RTOs and employers can help reduce that angst. So that is um, the series. Um, the series is available for um, purchase. There is some chat going on there, Michelle. <laughs> yes, I just... Jinx on Wendy and I were um, madly typing the same thing by the by the looks of it because Teresa had a question. Um, she's saying that she's happy with how the their RTO is collecting the evidence and um, how that they're assessing candidates correctly. But the main concern that she's got is around how auditors are going to view this and. Um, <laughs> I'm not a very fast typer, but almost simultaneously, both Wendy and I put in the response that the auditors are going to still need to see that the tools that have been used adhere to the principles of assessment and that the evidence that is provided by the candidate will meet the rules of evidence. So the assessor is going to be assured that they can, you know, meet those rules. Um, and also the principles of assessment. Um, oh, yes. I think 
Yeah, I think um, John Price last week described it as his black box. Black box approach. Yeah. yeah. So this is the backroom stuff. This is nothing mm. that the candidate needs to see. And he used um, you know, mapping or spreadsheet um, to um, summarise units and come up, come up with benchmarks. Yeah. Um, and those benchmarks are utilised um, to conduct the, um, to um, make sure evidence is valid, um, sufficient, um, and the assessment reliable. process is fair, reliable. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> mm. Mm. yeah. And uh, I think um, Wendy's saying in here, map, map, and map, and do it properly. And, and totally agree because yeah. there's mapping. You can have a mapping document that looks like it's wonderful because it's got a lot of information or a lot of data in there. But unless that data is validated to be having been entered correctly and entered correctly against the unit requirements where it needs to be collecting the evidence, um, that's one part of it. And then whether or not the question that's or the data that's been mapped there is actually collecting what the evidence requires, it also needs to be validated. So that mapping is a crucial component and underpins any assessment process, whether it's RPL or train and assess. And again, uh, <laughs> there must be some sort of ESP going on there because, <laughs> because Wendy and I are, are, are saying the same thing. Wendy's typing um, just exactly what I'm saying, that the pre-mapping of the assessment controls the process and validate, validate, validate. Make sure that constant check is in place there, Teresa, to make sure um, what's actually being collected is relevant. It's actually the right type of evidence and um, just ensure that that's one aspect of it, but also that the data that's being entered is correct. And, and Teresa's coming and saying, like, we've got some very vague elements of um, competency in our units and it's difficult to collect the physical evidence for. So, Deb, have you come across anything like that? And, Wendy, here's your cue to get typing on, on that answer. Mm, mm. I think that was the problem of the guy that worked at the bank. That was uh, the, the standard of performance mm. um, rather than just doing the skill, doing the task itself. Um, and those soft skills, perhaps, that you're talking mm. about, Teresa. Mm. Um, challenge tests, um, observations, just going into the workplace and observing them doing things um, is a great um, a tool to do that. Um, what kind of behaviours, observable behaviour, um, are you looking for that shows evidence of having those competencies? Mm. I would, I would uh, shadowing. That's what yeah, Wendy said. So following them around in their in their workplace, but doing those that pre mapping and also the conversation with them beforehand to understand the industry or the workplace contextualization of what that behaviour will look like in their workplace. What am I looking for? I've pre mapped. This is what I'm looking for, and I'll go in and have a look at it. I'll shadow them. I'll follow them. Or perhaps um, if you can't get there. Um, um, the GoPros um, mm. I've heard are being used. So when I'm doing something, um, and that was it as a vet nurse as well as a sign writer, um, doing it and, and talking about doing it. I do this because mm. this reason. Um, mm. I make sure I do this because it's important of this. Why am I doing it this in this manner? Um, mm. People that um, they're usually aware of the underlying principles of the underlying um, quality assurance or the reasons why they are doing it in a certain way. Does mm. that make sense? It did to me. I'll, I'll, I'll leave Teresa to pop in um, a yes or a no as a response to that. <clears throat> and Teresa's sort of saying that the, the knowledge component is harder to collect. And on that, the knowledge questions uh, or the knowledge components of any unit um, are there to assess the what. So it's very yeah. difficult to know what is what is in someone's head. And that scenario that you've just described where someone has that GoPro and they're saying, well, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm putting this paint with that paint because da -da -da, they're explaining the underpinning rationale as to why they're performing that particular action. And that's so, so critical because how do you know otherwise that they actually know why to do that, 
versus, oh, because I saw old mate do that the other day, so um, I'm just copying that and that's the way I've always done it. Um, the, the latter would not necessarily be a strong claim for competency. So the other thing as well, I've seen many RPL tools where the 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 questions or the the knowledge evidence is still collected via questioning. Mm. Mm. I've seen I've seen in a case where someone's had to write a two thousand word essay. Oh, mm, for an RPL. A lot of the time, though, with the candidates that I were talking that I was talking to, they had to talk about the underpinning um, learning because um, they were um, assessors. They had to talk about um, learning um, theories. And a lot of them had actually forgotten, so um, they did a brush up. They actually did a brush up of their of their um, underpinning theories, and then they answered the theory questions. Um, that could be done verbally as well as um, in writing, um, yes. or or just narrating what I'm doing. Absolutely. Wendy suggested to su suggested that um, knowledge can be inherent in practice. You can't undertake a practical if you don't have the knowledge. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So and, and I think you touched on a, an important point there too, Deb. Just because it's called questioning doesn't mean it needs to be written question and answers. Mm. It can be verbal questioning. It, it's just um, a, a method to collect the evidence, how you record that evidence and then record your judgment on that evidence becomes the critical component for compliance sake. Mm. Mm. I think Teresa's got some of her answers. That's terrific. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Wendy. <laughs> yes, it's been very good uh, to, to see Wendy um, answering those questions and chipping in because even though the the internet connection wouldn't have su necessarily supported the live um, join-in, it's been excellent to, to have that chat functionality. Mm. It looks like uh, all of the questions are getting answered there, Deb. And I'll, I'll just uh, see if there's anything else that you'd like to mention before we need to wrap up for the session. No, um, there there is not. Um, I think this has been a really valuable activity um, for myself as well as um, a town, I hope for attendees. Um, it, it, as I said before, we haven't discussed compliance. Uh, we've discussed um, principles, I guess, of approach at program level um, and the compliance falls out of that. I think many times in our sector we rush to the bottom line and, of compliance. So it's, it's important and we need to be confident when we have auditors at our, at our establishments that we know what we're talking about. These webinars were around uh, an approach and principles and candidate, for candidate experience. So I think that they do speak to compliance as well um, because it builds our capacity, our expertise in RPL to be able to have those conversations with auditors as well. Absolutely. And it has, as I said at the start of the session, it's been a wonderful journey to come along with you for the 10 sessions, Deb, and thank you very much for taking the initiative to put the results of your research out there. Um, often research is done, it's written up, and it's up to interested parties to go and access that. But by bringing it to the program managers and bringing it to the stakeholders, um, you've been able to generate quite a lot of discussion. And as Wendy is saying, a lot of thought provoking episodes. So very much grateful for that. Excellent. So on that, we'll uh, thank everyone for, for coming along. And if you've been with us for the whole series, thank you for that. Uh, I'll pop in here very quickly Deb's contact details so that if you do have any other questions that you'd like to broach with Deb, you can um, get on to Deb at deb at debcar.com.au, shoot across an email for Deb and um, also on her LinkedIn page. So make sure you'll be able to contact Deb in a couple of different ways there. But that's it from us. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, attendees. Thanks very much, Wendy. Bye. Bye now.